The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. Welcome, everybody. The Yaron Brook Show. We're having some uh, great weather here, although it's raining right now. In Puerto Rico, just got back from dinner um, at a restaurant, really nice restaurant. Things slowly coming back to normal. It's it's really nice to see. Beaches are open. They've got umbrellas out and chairs. For a while, beaches were open, but you weren't allowed to sit in a chair. Now they've got the chairs out. They've got the umbrellas out. Everything's Everything is really coming back to normal. So, um, you know, postpone my return to California a little bit because things here are too nice. So, uh, but I will be uh, spending uh, July and August, most of July and August in California. But for now, I'm still here in, uh, in uh, Puerto Rico. All right. Uh, today, okay, tomorrow we've got a show, same time. I think it's also going to be at 8 p.m. in the evening. Uh, tomorrow, I'll definitely go to the beach. So today, I didn't. But tomorrow, we'll definitely go to the beach. Uh, gym's not open in Santa Clara. Well, I hope... But, but I hear Orange County, where I'm heading, the gyms are open. So I'm counting on that. So I'm going to do my, uh, my high-intensity super slow, uh, which I can't do in Puerto Rico. But I can do in, uh, I can do in uh, Orange County. So I'm looking forward to that, to doing that once or twice a week. Uh, and because um, I hear my gym is open in, in Orange County. All right, uh, today we're going to talk about two topics, somewhat, well, we'll see how they're related they are. But our first topic will be the rule of law, uh, you know, seeing people uh, pulling down monuments and rioting and violence and chairs and just everything else going on, the craziness and insanity that's going on. I thought it would be a good time to remind us of what the rule of law is, why it's important, why it is the basis uh, for a uh, civilized country, and and how how us losing it, it, it you know, has has real significance. Um, and uh, it seems we're clearly abandoning the rule uh, the rule of law. And then um, then I want to talk about I, I was I, I was on Twitter. And I saw uh, Brett Weinstein was on Joe Rogan, and uh, Brett has this proposal uh, for an independent party, uh, an independent candidate to run against Trump and Biden. And I just thought the whole approach was interesting and uh, different, and there's certain things that are certainly attractive about what he says, and but then there's a certain emptiness to the whole thing as well. So uh, we will... Um, I want to talk about that. I'll show you the video of Brett Weinstein on Joe Rogan, and uh, we'll, we'll try to analyze what is being said. Uh, so, um, right. All right, so let's, let's talk about the rule of law. Uh, and, uh, and it's abandonment, I think. Uh, abandonment, not, not so much of where you live. It's who is violating the law. Um, where, you know, uh, uh, under what the context is, what the pretense is, who it is, how important they are, and yeah, where it is might count, but it's across the board. Well, you know, I want to talk about it not just in the sense of chairs or, or monuments and stuff like that, but also the president, previous presidents, Supreme Court rulings, insider trading for politicians. Uh, you know, there's a lot of this. It's not... This is not isolated. What you see in the streets is, is the most visual part of it, but there is a breakdown and has been a breakdown for a while now in the application of the law and, and in what it means to, to live under the rule of law. And you can see it if you listen to my show about the Federal Reserve the other night. You can see it in the Federal Reserve's actions, which are, you know, what law exactly applies to that? By what standard are they doing Anything that they're doing, clearly, again, a breakdown in the rule of law. So, 
yeah, there, there is a sense in which some of these the, the writing and so on is just one aspect of a much broader phenomena that we are experiencing in the culture today um, and experiencing it at, at multiple levels. And I think a lot of people focus on the thing that's most evident and most visual, but in some regards, that is the least important. It's the things behind us that are so much more, uh, so much more important. So why is the rule of law important, right? And what does it mean, the rule of law? Does the rule of law mean the rule of laws? So first, the rule of law is to separate from the rule of man, right? The idea of the rule of law is that there's certain objective, knowable, predictable laws out there that one can live by that they're not dependent on the arbitrary whim of a ruler a dictator, authoritarian, a judge, a policeman, a whoever, whoever has a gun, whoever has power. So the whole idea is to subordinate society to objectivity, to objective laws, rather than to subject society to, subjugate society to the rule of human beings, the rule of people, the rule of a system. And the idea of the rule of law is that the laws are not just arbitrary, they're not just whatever, but they're guided by particular principles, that there is a reason for them, justified not in, in, in arbitrary whim, justified not in the whim of any one person or in the whim of many people, in the whim of the majority. The idea of the rule of law is that the laws are there to achieve a certain purpose, really a certain moral purpose. Law should be grounded in morality. You don't legislate morality, but laws have to be grounded in a certain view of morality. And in the case of America, in the case of a free country, those laws should be grounded on the idea that your life belongs to you. In order to live your life, you must attain property, which belongs to you. And the laws are really there to protect you, your rights, your right to your life, your right to your property, your right to liberty, your right to act based on your own judgment, based on your own reason, in pursuit of the values that are necessary for your happiness. So laws are supposed to be, in the American legal system, at least the way I see it, I'm not sure many people in the legal system see it this way, laws are supposed to be grounded in the protection of individual rights. Their justification is, or should be, the protection of individual rights. Property rights, rights to liberty, right to your life. Laws are not objective when they violate those rights, when the consequence of the majority imposing itself on the minority. And we know Ayn Rand always said, the smallest minority on earth is the individual. So when the majority imposes themselves on the individual, when the majority violates the rights of the individual, that is not objective law. That is not the rule of law. That is the negation of the rule of law. So law should be grounded, must be grounded in morality, and must apply to all. We have equality before the law. All of us have rights. All of us have the right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. And the law must apply to all of us equally, the same. And must be protecting our rights equally and the same. And finally, these laws must be knowable predictable, objective. Objective both in the predictability and nobility, but also in the fact that they are grounded on something real, <clears throat> on the protection of rights. <clears throat> now, to some extent, uh, you know, America has always failed in this regard or for much of its history has failed, starting with slavery 
Jim Crow laws, obviously, were not grounded in the protection of individual rights and were not applied equally to everyone. Laws that discriminated are laws that don't constitute the rule of law. They're anti the rule of law. They're the negation of the rule of law. Because the negation for the purpose of law, which is the protection of rights. And remember that this idea of the rule of law, this idea of individual rights, even when it's not fully understood, even when it's practicing consistently as it was in America, but even in places like Europe and elsewhere, where it was certainly practiced inco inco inconsistently and to a large extent not even known, it was implicit, it wasn't explicit, there wasn't... The, the, the theory of individual rights did not motivate the legal agenda in Europe the way it did early on in the United States with a declaration and a constitution. European countries did not have that kind of constitution that was centered around this concept of individual rights, but implicit because the modern world in which we live is a world based on enlightenment ideas, based on enlightenment philosophy, based on enlightenment political theory, even when they don't know it, even among people who don't recognize that, who are not aware of it, who didn't do it consciously. The actual reality is that our system, our modern system, even a system in places like Japan or in, in parts of Asia that are, that, are, that are relatively free politically, they're based on ideas of enlightenment. They are based on ideas of individual rights, whether they know it or not. And almost all these systems have some protections for the individual against the majority. They have some protections of those rights. Not consistent, not systematic, certainly not as good as they have been at their best protected in the United States. But what dominates the free world are these Enlightenment ideas. And the Enlightenment ideas of the sanctity of the individual. And the Enlightenment political idea that the role of the state is to protect the rights of that individual. To leave him free. To pursue his own happiness. To pursue his own life. To pursue his own values. To pursue property. And to protect that pursuit from physical coercion. I mean, that is the foundational base of all countries that are today call themselves democracies. Because none of them are absolute democracies in a sense that the majority can vote on anything. All of them have some principles by which limit the power of the majority. So they're all inconsistent applications of the rule of law. They're all inconsistent applications of the idea of individual rights. But it's still the foundation for all of them. Now, what separates this modern era from previous eras? What makes, what's obvious about this era as compared to previous eras, the last 200, 250 years, is that we live in a civilized place. We live in a civilized world. We live in relative safety. We live in places where for the most part, again, with exceptions, right? We had communism and we had fascism, which were the exception. But for the most part, we live in places where you can mostly do what you want to do, say what you want to say, live your life according to your values. People don't intervene. People don't interrupt. And generally, the police are there to protect you and to put away criminals, put them in jail. And... The difference between living in such a civilized environment where the laws are predictable, you know what's going to happen, you're not at the whim of the majority or the dictator, you're not at the whim of the people in power, and the mobs don't control the streets, and the criminals don't run things, so that you can live life. Not perfectly, because we know the rule of law in the West has not been perfect. We have compromised on it forever. Vonda, thank you. That's very generous. But for the most part, we have lived in a world in which the rules were knowable, objective, predictable, and applied equally before the law with some exceptions, 
around Jim Crow laws and other things, but even that is somewhat behind us, although now we have other things like affirmative action, but imperfectly as it is. We've managed to build businesses, create wealth, own homes, live relatively safe life, safe from violence. We can walk in the streets, drive around. It's civilized. And a lot of what civilized means is this peace. We're not fighting in the streets. And we can protect, we don't have to arm ourselves to the teeth in order to protect our property. And we're not constantly in fear of our own government or of gangs or, of, you know, or for the most part of the police themselves. But that is a thin line between civilization and barbarity. It's only 300 years ago where this did not exist anywhere. I mean, there were better places and worse places. There were better kings and worse kings. But generally, it was a king and you were susceptible to his whim and the whim of those that he controlled and the whim of those who controlled him, depending on the place and the time. And before that, it was roving gangs and, you know, little towns and the church and just barbarity everywhere and violence and, and, and a threat to everything. And there, you, you couldn't, there was no preserving and maintaining your property without being armed to the teeth. And wealth was associated with buying firepower and buying protection. That's what you used your wealth for. There's nothing much to buy with wealth in those days. The rule of law is what allows us to live a civilized life. It was, allows us to live in safety, not fear for our lives and our property constantly. So it's something to monitor. It's something to be aware of. It's something that's important to make sure we don't lose. So when you see people smashing storefronts, rioting in the streets, and the police doing nothing, there is real reason to be concerned. When you see people knocking down monuments, look, I, I am a proponent of getting rid of monuments to the Confederacy. I don't believe there should be monuments to General Lee in public spaces. Now, I'm not big on public spaces to begin with, but if we have them, we shouldn't be celebrating the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis. These are the most anti-American people. These are people that committed treason and sedition. These are people who fought against the legitimate government of the United States of America. And these are people who did it in the name not of freedom, but in the name of slavery. In the name of maintaining other human beings as their property. And yeah, I would like to see every one of those statues toppled by the authorities, by the people who own the property, not by mobs, not by gangs, who then cannot differentiate between Thomas Jefferson and Jefferson Davis, between Lee and between George Washington. It's a mob mentality. Thinking is not strong in a mob. History is not strong in a mob. Violence, fear, anger, destruction, that is what mobs are for. And this is property. And you think it's public property, so it's no big deal. But once you abandon public property like that, then they're going to come after your property. They're going to come after private property, and they have, right? The riots smash private property, and nobody seems to care either. So I'm all for the monuments coming down, all of them. The names of the forts being changed. The fact that secession was considered okay back then, which I am very dubious of. Sounds like, uh, sounds like rewriting of history. Um, doesn't matter. 
These are bad people. Evil people. Evil people. Who maintained the right to secede in order to secede to maintain slavery. Secession is only valid if you're seceding to increase freedom. It's never valid if you're seceding in order to reduce freedom. So these are the enemies of the United States of America, the enemies of the Declaration of Independence, the enemies of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the enemies of the equality of man, equality before the law, equality of rights. And finally, we got to the point in American history where we were going to apply the idea of rule of law, equality before the law, and these people objected. These people rejected the Declaration of Independence. And if you read the intellectuals of the South during this period, they were anti-American, anti-Declaration, anti-Constitution, anti-Founding Fathers. They were influenced heavily by German philosophy. They were Hegelians. They were really bad folks. So monuments to them. No, put them in a museum where you explain how evil and bad they really are. Alex, wow, that is very, very generous. Thank you. A lot of really generous contributions on Super Chat tonight. It's just terrific. Thank you all for supporting me. A good, good chance to stop and say, you know, you can support me in a variety of different ways. Super Chat is one way, very much appreciated. You can also do it uh, monthly on... Uh, Patreon or uh, subscribestar.com or uh, on my website through PayPal, youronbookshow.com slash support and also on locals. The locals use Stripe. So you can do it Stripe, PayPal, credit card, uh, you know, and of course, Super Chat. So uh, uh, thank you all. So monuments should go, but there is a way to get rid of them. Petition. Demonstrate, write letters to your congressman or state senator, state congressman, get them to do their job. You know, I, I, I talked about Chaz, Chop, Chaz, whatever the hell they want to call it, which is a six block area in Seattle that has been taken over by the modern equivalents of the hippies. And those of you who think the hippies, was uh, all about love and uh, no violence. and f You know, you guys don't know what you're talking about. You know. Some of love in the 1960s was not exactly free of violence. You can't have anarchy without violence. You cannot have no rule of law and no violence. Violence comes right in with it. And I think we got the first casualty in, in uh, the Chaz area in Seattle and uh, somebody wounded. And I don't know what the police are doing. I, have, I haven't tracked it today to see if they're going in and doing anything about it. But, I mean, this is complete breakdown of the rule of law. The police are standing by and they're, they're letting this just mayhem happen. They've given up their precinct. They've walked away. So if you're an armed hippie with a sign saying Black Lives Matter and you seem to care about Black Lives Matter and you're protesting police brutality supposedly, everything is okay. You can get away with anything. Nobody's going to stop you. The law doesn't apply to you anymore. You can do whatever you want in Chaz. But Chaz is still the United States of America. And the fact that the police will not go in there the fact that the mayor of Seattle thinks this is cool. I mean, again, I don't think the federal government needs to go in there, but, but I hope the citizens of Seattle learn from this and vote these bastards out. Because this is another little break in civilization. Riots, monuments being ripped down, autonomous zones being created that are patrolled by armed men. By the way, I, I'm not a big fan of the fact that in Michigan, when they were, when they were um, protesting the lockdowns, 
armed men appeared in the state house and walked into the state house with arms. That too is a form of the breakdown of the rule of law. That is threatening. That is the equivalent of insurrection. Nobody was calling for the federal troops to go in to Michigan State House to get rid of them. There's something about when it is appropriate to carry a gun and when it is not. And if you're going demonstrating into a state house with an armed gun, you're basically declaring that you're in a revolution. I mean, the whole lockdowns. How about the alpha rule of law? Let's get, to, let's get to the big violations of the rule of law by government. How are lockdowns part of the rule of law? How are lockdowns on the scale and the scope that they will practice not massive violations of the rule of law? By what authority? By what authority? The state government shut down a whole state and prohibit you from exiting your home or prohibit you from walking along a street or from going into a park. By what authority? By what law? By what legal theory? Can they lock you at home when you have no disease, you're not a risk to anybody as far as they know? Aren't you presumed innocent until proven guilty? Doesn't there have to be some reasonable doubt or, or sorry, some reasonable cause before they suspect you and maybe lock you up for a while? But no, they can pass whatever law they want. They can do whatever they want. If they can lock us down, like they did during this pandemic, if they can just lock everybody down, every county, every town, every city, every village, what can't they do? What can't they do? I'm not sure there's ever been anything more outrageous than these lockdowns. I mean, obviously slavery, but it, at least in the last 30, 40 years, what's been more outrageous than the government basically telling tens of millions of Americans, you cannot leave your home? And one of the stunning things about it is that Americans just complied. They didn't resist. I mean, and I'm not talking about resisting with guns. I'm talking about just saying no. <laughs> We're going to go out. Leave us alone. Arrest us. Or, or even complaining. Writing letters to the editor. And will they vote these bastard out? About lockdowns, yeah. So lockdowns, rule of law. But there's more than that. There's uh, the police violence in and of itself. The police abuses. Where prosecution is selective. Where... You know, police unions get their police sometimes off the hook. New show, new chat. I don't know how we got a new show there. Still in the same thing. Anyway, I don't know how YouTube does that, but okay. I mean, and uh, police persecution is also above and beyond that. It is also... Think about this guy in, um, in Atlanta, this policeman in Atlanta that's being prosecuted. Would he be charged for murder if not for the riots, the demonstrations? Is he being selectively chosen to be prosecuted because there is an uproar right now? So, by the way, if you ask the Super Chat question, I copied and pasted it, so I should have... Other super chat questions, so don't don't worry. Um, I have the super chat questions. So I, I again, I don't have a strong opinion about whether you should be prosecuted or not, but you get a sense that the only reason, or the primary reason, they're prosecuting is because of the uproar. A policeman somewhere else does something similar, or does it to a white person, and he won't get prosecuted. So you get no equality before the law. The Federal Reserve, I talked about the Federal Reserve a uh, couple of nights ago. I mean, where are they getting their authority from? Authority to 
completely destroy our financial markets to buy whatever assets they want. And every week, they do something different. Every financial crisis, they announce new programs that they pluck out of the air. They have, at this point, unlimited authority. There's no limitation. There's no idea of the rule of law. There's no idea of the limitations, legal limitations. There's no idea of individual rights. There's no idea of the proper role. They just, whatever. Whatever they think will work. Whatever they think will achieve their goal. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. The Fed never used to be like this. Never used to be like this. And even the, the, the federal government, which is re redistributing our wealth and regulating and controlling, uh, you know, forever. But it's definitely, it's definitely worse. They can print money as much as they want. They can redistribute as much as they want. Laws don't have to stand up to any particular scrutiny. If the Supreme Court doesn't like a particular law, then they knock it down. If they like it, they make up law in order to justify it. Remember um, Roberts calling the, the, you know, the Obamacare mandate a tax, and therefore it's okay, it's constitutional. I mean, they can make it up as they go. There's no standard. There's no rule of law. I mean, it's not clear that this ruling on DACA whether it made any sense. I, I support it in a sense that I think it's good to not have to take these kids and throw them out of the country. But is this the right way to do it? Was that really objective, what they ruled, how they ruled it? Standards they used? I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a legal expert. But it, it strikes me that I at least have lost all um, respect for the Supreme Court as being guided by principle, by a principle of rights, by principle of the Constitution. There is no Constitution. They make it up literally as they go along. They apply what they want, when they want it, how they want it. And then you look at our politicians. And this goes back a long time, but the selective way in which they apply the law to whom they want, how they want it, when they want it. I mean, Trump probably worse than anybody, but look at Obama. Obama was terrible. The IRS scandal, which I've talked about before, just one among many, or how they use the FISA courts, secret courts. In the United States of America, we have secret courts. So you could be, somebody could be listening in to your phone calls. Somebody could be tapping your lines, not by getting a proper warrant in front of an open court by a regular judge, no, but by some secret court that you can never question, that you can never challenge. Clearbridge thinks Obama was the worst. No, I, I think Trump is worse than Obama. He's taken Obama and taken it one step further because Trump does it openly. He just doesn't care about the law. But FISA courts, which are under Bush, invented under Bush, used and will be used for political reasons, political motivations, I believe, for every one of our presidents moving forward. So I really think we're on a precipice. Uh, by the way, one of the examples of a lack of rule of law is when the Supreme Court says that it's basing its standard for making a decision based on what it thinks that a majority of Americans want. Democracy, pure democracy, unlimited majority democracy is anti the rule of law. Because it divorces law from any principle. And of course, what characterizes the kind of state in which we're living in today is no principle. No principle. 
And therefore, no knowability, no predictability, no objectivity. And this is how civilizations die. This is how we descend into authoritarianism and barbarism. It's when you rights, when you lose respect for the courts and the police, which all of us have to some extent. When the powers to be can do pretty much whatever they want. You know, I've got one of my examples is cited trading. You know, the senators who, who got a briefing about COVID from the intelligence agencies agencies didn't make the briefing public, didn't let the rest of us know. I don't know what's going on with bandwidth today. Didn't let the rest of us know what was going on with COVID. But they traded on the information. They made money off of it. So the rest of us are supposed to live by the rule of law, but not them. Yeah, bandwidth is struggling. Don't know what's going on. That's, that's what happened before, I think, too, is I think it's my internet access is, uh, is struggling here. Usually, I have well over 100, 200 megabytes per second. And right now, it's struggling. It's struggling. All right. Well, hopefully, it'll come back. It seems to be going in and out, and that's, uh, that's the impact. But I hope it's not affecting sound. Can you guys get the, you get the sound? Or have I lost you again? Uh, now is when I want you to chat and you stay silent. All right. All right. Nobody's hacking me, don't worry. I, I doubt that anybody thinks I'm a big enough threat to be hacked. <laughs> uh, are you guys... Uh, are we on? Sound is good. Picture comes in and out. All right. It, it, looks, like, it looks like we're okay. <sighs> so these are things to watch for. These are things to be aware of because civilization is too precious to just walk away from it. We need to be aware and concerned about unlimited majority rule, about real democracy. We need to be concerned and aware about the unequal application of the law. We need to be concerned and aware when police stand back as people clearly commit violence and the police do nothing about it. These are warning signs of the beginning of the end. Hopefully just a phase we're going through and there'll be a rebound. But how are we going to get a rebound when the two presidential candidates in 2020 are... Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Where is the savior? <laughs> Where is somebody even marginally sane who could help us over the hump that we're in right now, help this country find its bearing, return us to a more civilized, civilized, you know, civilized state? Not these two. It truly is a tragedy that this is the choice we face in November. And on that note, I want to bring in Brett Weinstein. So uh, Brett Weinstein was on Joe Rogan. Let's find Joe Rogan. Here we are. There we go. You can see Joe Rogan. And uh, so he had some things to say about the choice we've got. Joe Jorgensen is the libertarian candidate. She's not going to win. She's not going to get a lot of votes at all because America doesn't want a libertarian. America's not libertarian today. I just want a little bit of sanity. Forget free markets. Just a little bit of sanity. Just a little respect for the founders. A little respect for the rule of law. But, and, and Joe Jogerson is... Too radical for America today. And she's part of a libertarian party that is completely in disrepute. Completely in disrepute. So she has no chance and the party cannot win. And it, 
So let's let's look at Brett Weinstein. He's got some proposals. Let me put my um, headphones on. He's got he's got a proposal on how to how to give us more choices when it comes to November. The Joe Rogan Experience. Right. How did we get here? It's Good 2020. Question. We are facing a global pandemic, which incidentally I do want to talk to you about. Okay. Um, we are facing a global pandemic. We are facing rioting in the streets, a movement that's showing signs of a uh, Maoist challenge to the most fundamental aspects of the West. Maoist challenge, which is great. I mean, Maoist challenge in, in a sense of complete rejection of individual rights and communism, kind of, a, kind of complete control over our lives. It's good to see somebody like Brett Weinstein recognize that that is what is being asked for in the streets. That is where we are. Right? And we are going to have to choose between Donald Trump and Joe Biden? Perfect. I love the way he says that. And he's so right because it is so disgusting that that is the choice. 21st century in America, we're facing all these challenges. And what do we get? We get Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Unbelievable. What? Like, neither one of these people is capable of or inclined towards the kind of leadership that you have just described we would need. Absolutely. Absolutely. Agreed. And I, didn't, I don't know what leadership uh, Rogan mentioned. I mean, Rogan was going to vote for Bernie Sanders, so Rogan is questionable on all of this to begin with. But there is no capacity for leadership anywhere in either political party right now. So that means at, a very, at the very least, if we do not divert our course, right, if November comes and we are choosing between those two, then that means we're putting off any solution at least four years because the president, the president would be essential to changing our course. I think that's right. I think you need at this point leadership. You need a voice. You need somebody to articulate some ideas, articulate a vision, and, and I was going to do a show on leadership today. Maybe we'll do it um, next week. But, but you need leadership. And right now, Donald Trump is not a leader. To be a leader, you have to have principle. You cannot be a fly-by-night, shoot from the hip, whatever you feel like, whatever, you know, whatever your whims are, just change day by day and cannot for the constitution of the rule of law in this country, which is what Donald Trump is. And Joe Biden is just, a, a, he's just incompetent, can barely get two sentences out. Neither one of these are going to inspire, which is what leaders must do. Neither one of these can motivate, which is what leaders must do. Neither one of these have an agenda, which that's what leadership is about. It's about bringing to reality an agenda, a vision, a, 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 a goal. And neither one of them has this. They're truly, truly incompetent. I can't think of two more incompetent individuals to be running for president of the United States of America. We're not talking about some third-rate banana republic somewhere. Right? And this is just built into these parties now. Right? Obama, I can't figure out why it's the case. I really like Obama personally. He seems like the right guy to me. But yeah, Brett. Uh. His, his administration at a, at, a, at a policy level was indistinguishable from Bush. In some ways, it was worse. So what we've got is parties that decide what we get to choose from, and the game is to prevent us from having any choice that could possibly solve the problem. So we have to fix that. We have to address that problem, and we have to break their stranglehold. And, you know... Uh, in fairness, Trump was a challenge to that two-party duopoly. He's not really a Republican, That's true. Right? right? But he's also not really an alternative. It's like a th But he is a Republican now because the Republican Party has basically shifted itself to become Trump. He wasn't a Republican. The Republican Party wasn't Trump. But today, today he is the Republican Party, and the Repu Pu Republican Party is him. That is where they are. So it would, be, it would be a completely different world today 
if the Republican Party had re actually rebelled against Trump, if the existing Republican Party actually had presented a nominee to go after Trump, but they can't because, what is it, 90% of Republicans support Trump, of registered Republicans support Trump? He is one of the most... Um, one of the most respected or uh, admired or supported Republican presidents by Republicans ever. They love him. He is the Republican Party today. He's not an outsider anymore. Third crime family, right? Yeah. You've got the Republicans, the Democrats, and now the They Trumps. sort of co-opted their ideology to fit his needs. Yeah. Um, but... It's not a solution. Right. So we have to get that solution, which means we have to get by the parties. Trump proved that was possible. Right. I think if, there's ever, if there was ever a time where an independent party has a chance, now is the time. If someone steps in and has a, a real solution. And also, for, in terms of the distribution of that information, now is the time. I agree with that. I think now is the time. Because... All right, I think we're back. All right, we're back. Here we go. Someone was a, a person of substance that we really believed in. We said, uh, that person can really do this. This actually could happen. Let's vote independent. It could happen. They don't have a monopoly on the distribution of information anymore. And that's terrifying to them because they used to be able to count on the shills on the left and the right to get the word out for them. But they, they don't have that anymore. You have so many people that really don't have an ideological foundation in either one of them that are talking and they're reaching millions of people. That's a rare moment in time. And this is, in my opinion, the very best time for someone to step in that's not, they're not compliant. They're not, they don't have to give it, they don't, they don't need that policy machine behind them, or, or the political machine behind them. Well, I've got a plan. Okay. But we would have to find a really big podcast, I think, to get enough momentum. There's you, none of those out there. You though. haven't encountered a big podcast? No, they don't. Yeah, so Brett's going to propose his plan, so let's yes. just okay. analyze his plan. <laughs> um, all right, you want to hear the plan? Sure. Okay. The Rock and Jocko Willink. Mm -hmm. um, get them together. Well, you know, let's put that... Uh, Okay. <laughs> Let's put that to the side. It's not part okay. of the plan, but it actually could fit. Oh, okay. Okay? So here's the, the plan. Um, this plan needs a better name, but the working title is the Dark Horse Duo Plan. Um, Dark Horse Duo. And the plan looks like this. We draft two individuals. We find two people. One of them is center-left, and one of them is center-right. So two individuals who have no principles and no plan because they're just in the center center left and center right, they can agree on what? On, on more violations of rights and they're not going to be crazy, granted, but what are they going to agree on exactly? And what are we going to get? What are the principles that are going to guide them? What is the leadership that they're going to project? Leadership towards what? No, I think electing Trump is the worst of all worlds. Really. And these people have to have certain characteristics, a minimum set. They have to be patriotic, they have to be courageous, and they have to be highly capable, right? But that's it. Okay. Center left and a center right. And we pair them together. And we draft them uh, with the following plan, that they will govern as a team. That is to say, every important decision will be uh, discussed and they will decide what to do as a team and only in cases where they cannot reach agreement or whether something has to be whenever something has to be decided on a very short time scale like a military decision um, does the person who inhabits the role of the president uh, govern alone okay we draft these folks and then four years down the road they switch and the one who had run for president now runs for the vice presidential spot, and the one who uh, was vice president now runs for president. And they continue this way until one of two things happens. Either we vote someone else in, 
or one of them has inhabited the office of president twice and is no longer eligible, and then that person has to be replaced. So we have a patriotic team governing together from center left and center right. But when you say drafted, that's the problem. Like someone has to be motivated to ruin their fucking lives to try to run this country because well, that's what happens to everybody that does it. I so here's the problem, right? So you, you have two respectable people, one from the center right and one from the center left. Now, I would vote for the, any duo, pretty much, that Brett Weinstein is going to propose because they're better than the people running right now. And uh, they're going to do less damage than the nutty people today in the Republican and Democratic Party. But this isn't the solution. This is just a way to buy some time. And look, I'm for buying time because I don't think there is a solution other than buying time at this point. So I'm all for this plan. I'm mean, even for the people he's got. He's going to nominate in a minute the actual people to do it. I would vote for them in a heartbeat over the options we have today. The problem I see is that Brett is putting way too much hope in this because he thinks the solutions are somewhere in the middle. And yet the solutions, somebody says online, this is great. This is the path of least destruction. I, I love that. That's perfect. Yeah, it's the path of least destruction. Because the solutions are not in the middle. The solutions are radical as they always are. They're so radical, they mean a return to the founding fathers. They mean a return to the founding documents of this country. They mean a return to the founding principles of this country. It means a return to the rule of law in this country. And I just don't think pe two people from the center can do that. They can't because they don't believe in it. They have no concept of it. So I'm great with this plan as long as it's understood as the path of least destruction, not a path to liberation, not a path to freedom, but a path to buying us time. And anything that can prevent us from electing Donald Trump or Joe Biden buys us time. Because I think both Trump and Biden are accelerating us towards disaster. They're accelerating us towards authoritarianism. They're accelerating us, accelerating us towards the end of this country. Brett is not a principled thinker. And, it's, and you see, this is the thing. That he's not advocating any principles. And he's not a principle thinker. He doesn't believe in, in real principles. In politics, everybody out there, almost everybody out there, is a pragmatist. Now, Trump is a committed pragmatist in a way and committed to emotion and committed to his narcissism in a way that nobody else is. But everybody is a pragmatist. It's not like Joe Biden has a philosophy or guiding principles. He's a pragmatist. I mean, Bernie Sanders is closer to having principle. Brett, in his politics, is a complete pragmatist. And both of them are. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Brett, Brett Hall, not Brett Weinstein, mentions uh, that both Weinsteins are kind of philosopher king types. And yes, they are. They're the smart, they're smart intellectuals who think they have all the answers. Well, they think they have all the answers to some things. But they don't really, and they, and they don't have any principles to guide their answers. They're wishy-washy. They're pragmatists when it comes to politics. They don't have principles. They just think that because they are smarter than everybody else, their pragmatism would actually work. And other pragmatists, uh, you know, and other, other peoples won't. But there's no principle behind their views. But then that's an obstacle. You're spelling out right. an obstacle that I would argue is solvable, that we know these people. Who? Okay, so okay. let's just say, that's the plan so far, and yes. we can talk about what problems it solves as much as you want. I feel like I should have a drink and listen to this. You're welcome to have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's we probably a good idea. kidding, but go ahead. Um, but, uh, okay, so here's my proposal. So the plan could be right, and my proposal for who we draft could be wrong, and I'm happy to see other people swapped in. Okay. But my proposal would be uh, Admiral William McRaven on the right, 
You know who that is? No, I don't. Okay, he is a Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL. Um, he was until 2018 the Chancellor of the University of Texas. He is a um, very cogent uh, center right Republican. So I don't know anything about this uh, general, uh, although he sounds like an admirable guy. He was special operations leader on many, many, many important missions from capturing Saddam Hussein to bin Laden to uh, many, many other things. I mean, he is uh, clearly one of the great you know, military men of his generation. He was the chancellor of the University of Texas. Uh, so he's run a big organization. He is now a kind of a leadership management consulting type and uh, probably a good guy. I, I don't know what his politics are. To say that he's center right, I, I don't even know what that means. No, it's not the guy with the eye patch. <laughs> so it's, it's you know, uh, I, I don't know anything about his politics. So it sounds like a decent guy. I'd probably vote for him over anybody in the field right now. But I, I, I can't comment. I tried to look him up a little bit. Couldn't find much on his politics. So I have no real views. But he sounds like a decent human being, which is... Can't say about the current crop of candidates. Um, he was the lead on the bin Laden raid. Yep. And he is, uh, I think, universally respected by people who know him. I've never heard anybody say negative things about him. Um, on the center left. Let me see this gentleman. I'm going to look at his face. Yeah, you're, you're going to oh. know. There he oh, is. yeah, I have seen that guy before. I like it. Looks like a president to me. Yeah, it looks like a president to me too. Yeah. You know who else looks like a president to me? Who? Andrew Yang. I'm I'm down with that. Okay. So, I like what you're saying now. Good. So I'm not sure what they see in Andrew Yang. I mean, he's, he seems like a nice guy. He's kind of mellow, but I, he doesn't look presidential. He doesn't sound presidential. He he's not particularly motivating. He's not particularly. He's a geek. Um, his ideas, are, uh, you know, as a central planner, as another philosopher king, I guess he fits the Brett Weinstein model because he is, um, he's really smart and he thinks he can run our lives like Brett and, 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 and his brother do. But, eh, I don't think he can win. He couldn't even win the Democratic nomination. Why would you take a loser? Why would you take a loser? And run a loser. My point. Uh, those Admi two guys together. Those two. Is that camera on? Yes. Admiral, your country needs you. It really does. There's an appeal. Let's appeal to his... Uh, it's time to sacrifice some more. Never more than now. Um, and I know that the job of president is a sucky one. I'm sure the job of vice president's even worse. Um, but... Please consider this plan because uh, the republic is in jeopardy. Now, we already know that Andrew Yang is up for the job because he yeah. ran for he office. He ran. Yes. And, you know, <laughs> faced appallingly stupid obstacles that, in my opinion, may in be the reason that he's not the nominee. Um, so here we got two people. One of them, I think, will do so out of duty. The other is crazy enough to want the job in the first place. <laughs> um, and what are they? Well... They're both patriots, they're both courageous, and they're both highly capable. All right, this well, is, I, this know, is the I, I think that's enough. If you want to watch the rest, you can, you can go watch, uh, watch it on Joe Rogan. Um, I, I think the point here is that there's no proposal here other than let's get some people who are relatively safe, not, uh, sane. Now, I would vote for Andrew Yang over Biden and over Trump in a heartbeat. I, I don't think he could get half of his proposal passed because most of them are nutty and, and he'd get stuck in a, in a Congress that was fighting against each other. And I like, I like the, 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 you know, the, the, the Navy SEAL guy, the admiral, I guess, or the general. Um, sounds like an interesting choice. And yeah, that's great. But what is the goal other than sanity? Now, sanity is a good goal. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to slam sanity. Sanity is better than insanity. And what we have today is insanity. And what we're looking at in, in, in this election is insanity. So I'll, I'll take sanity. But let's be honest. This isn't a solution. This is, again, a philosopher king appointing smart people who he thinks can run things well. 
But they know there's no principle. What is the principle that can save America? What is the principle that can lead us out of this darkness? What is the principle by which we solve the problems that we face? What is the principle by which we should legislate or eliminate legislation in the future? Nobody has a principle. Andrew Yang certainly doesn't. I mean, he, he's bought into the, the, the uh, Luddite ideas about jobs. He's got a weird view of we should pay everybody and, you know... Uh, uh, but at least he's got some ideas. I'll give him that. He's, he's, he's better than 90% of other politicians because at least he's trying. But again, no principles. And the principle, of course, is individual rights. But they don't know it. Certainly those guys don't know it. Certainly Joe Rogan and Brett Weinstein wouldn't know it. I mean, I would be surprised if Brett Weinstein recognized that there was such a thing as individual rights. Uh, all right. So somebody's asking, who would you draft? A team that could actually win. I, you know, I don't know. It, it's a hard one. Um, I think Nikki Haley could win. I, I, would, I would support Nikki Haley. Um, again, I don't think she's a... I don't think she's a... Um, individual rights-loving, principled capitalist... But she at least gives lip service to capitalism, said some really good things about foreign policy when she was at the UN, and has run a state, has so been a governor, can, can do the job, and is respectable and, and, and seems like a straight shooter. Right. Who else would I draft? I don't know. There, there are probably some senators that would be okay. I mean, many of them are too religious for my liking, but... At least they're human beings. Somebody like Ben Sass, I think from Kansas. Too religious, but has some decent views on other stuff and seems like a, a, a good human being. Somebody mentions Ben Shapiro. Here's one. Ben Shapiro and Amy Klobuchar. I like that. I like that. All right. Or Nikki Haley and Amy Klobuchar. Two women. And, and Nikki Haley's not even, quote, White. Senator Rick Scott. Um, which one's Rick Scott? Wh wh which state's he from? So I think, I, th I think you've got people. I think you've got better people out there. Can they win? I don't know. They probably cannot win their, their, their party nomination. That's part of the problem. Yeah, Nikki Haley's way too friendly with Trump, unfortunately. And, and she's figured out that, you know, there was some, at some point there was a rumor that he was going to dump Pence and make her his VP and set her up for the next election. So I, I think she's, she's played nice. Oh, Rick Scott, used to be the governor, former governor of Florida. I don't know. I don't, maybe. It wouldn't be harmful, probably. Just a center, right, middle of the road. Peter Schiff can't win. Somebody said they wanted a realistic. Peter Schiff can't win. He ran for the Senate. He couldn't win the Republican nomination. He's not going to win. We're looking at people who, who could win, not people who would be our ideal candidate. I mean, I think... Um, what's his name? Um, Justin Amash. Again, I disagree with him on foreign policy, and I disagree with him on uh, abortion and uh, certain religious issues. But relative to the field... Yeah, but he can't win. He's too good on capitalism. So I think there are a number of teams out there that are better than what we have. And I wish, I've, I've said this, I said this years ago. I mean, there's a group of, Ted Cruz is horrible. Not only is he religious, but now he's become a Trump, you know, complete sellout. A complete sellout. I used to have a little bit of respect for Ted Cruz. I have zero now. I don't like Rand Paul is the same way. No respect for Rand Paul. Crenshaw, no respect for Crenshaw. Anybody who is just licking Trump's boots. I was going to say something worse than that. Mark Cuban is a complete socialist sellout. He's an anti-capitalist. They did a show on Mark Cuban. Complete, completely horrible Mark Cuban. Rand Paul is a complete disappointment. 
Crenshaw is terrible. Anybody who's an apologist for, for Donald Trump, maybe with the exception of Nikki Haley, is out. Out. Do you have any all-time favorite politicians? Well, the founders. I'll take any of the founders. Even the ones who, who made horrible mistakes like John Adams as president, you know, I would take over everybody. David French, he's an intellectual. He's not a politician. He's not going to run, and he can't win. And, and David French is... Mixed, he's very religious, very religious, and intellectually so. I get his newsletter uh, by email, and on Sundays, oh my God, he goes into all this religious Catholic stuff. Yeah, Founders, uh, um, um, what's his name? Cleveland, Grover Cleveland is a great president. Coolidge um, was, was, was a good president. Coolidge is the best in the 20th century. Um, what's his name? Uh, Cleveland was probably the best in the 19th century. But, you know, Goldwater, you asked about politicians, not presidents. Do you have any all-time favorite politicians? Goldwater was, was somebody I, I respected uh, and, and could vote for, right? I, I mean, he lost in a landslide. Lost in a landslide. But he was a – you wouldn't call him a centrist Republican because he was, he was centrist in social policies. He was liberal in social policies and was a, as about, a, about as capitalist as they come on capitalism. And I'm hoping that somebody like Nikki Haley can be somewhat of a Goldwater. I, I don't know that she can. There's nobody, there's no really anybody in the Republican Party today who is a, who is a Goldwater-like person. All right, let's go through some of these Super Chat questions, then we'll call it a night. Um, Joko was on Rogan and rehashed the meme, we need to make things again. Joe loved it. If only you could teach Joko and Joe economic facts to challenge it. Well, I mean, we do need to make things again. I, I don't know what the we has to mean. But what does make things mean? It doesn't mean we have to bring manufacturing back to the United States. That's just silly. And as I've said many, many times, we manufacture more things today in the United States than we ever had. Somebody says Nikki Haley and Tulsi Gabbard. No, no, no. You can't give Tulsi the presidency even for half a day. She's a nut. And she's a pacifist. She's crazy on foreign policy. And Nikki Haley and Tulsi would butt heads on foreign policy. Oh, my God. There's no way they could get along together. So, uh, yeah, we don't need to make things. But, you know, we make more things today than we've ever made. We didn't lose manufacturing. We actually... We're only the only thing we lost was jobs in manufacturing because, because computers and, and robots, not because of China. Right? So, yes, I wish I could go on Joe Rogan and talk to him about ethics, about economics, about politics, about the world, about reality. It would be phenomenal. I mean, what an audience he has. I mean, that would be the biggest thing I've done, bigger than... Bigger than um, Dave Rubin or um, Ben Shapiro when I was on Ben Shapiro's show. So uh, I don't think the interview would... And plus, he does it for three hours. I'd love... I mean, I don't like doing shows for three hours because I'm, I'm just talking. and have to make it up as I go along. But to be interviewed for three hours, to, to, to have a conversation with somebody for three hours with Joe Rogan, I mean, that would be a treat. It would be so much fun. And, and I think... I, I mean, I think he's worried about having me on, but I think we'd actually have a good time. I think we'd have a good time. I've emailed him. I've, I've again, uh, what's his name? Dave Rubin has, has suggested me to be on a show. It, it, nothing's working. He's not doing it. It is what it is. And you, an interviewer asked Jordan Peterson, how can he trump the rights of the transgender not to get their feelings hurt? Why don't rights apply to feelings? Well, because rights apply to freedoms of action. Rights are, rights are freedoms of action. Rights mean you are free to act in a particular way. Rights are the recognition that you are free to act 
in pursuit of your happiness, without coercion, without somebody forcing themselves on you, without an authority telling you what you can and cannot do, And that's what rights mean. Now, emotions, you have a right to your emotions. You have a right to live, and that includes your emotions. But you can't be given anything. Rights don't give you stuff other than the space, the freedom to go live. So I don't know what you mean by why don't rights apply to emotion, uh, feelings. Rights apply... To actions, to your freedom to act. And that includes your right to act on your emotions, as long as you're not interfering with other people's rights. It's not the purpose of rights to protect your actions that are based on whim. But it's the consequence of rights that you have it. But hurting somebody's feelings is not hurting is not violating their rights. Maybe that's what you mean by the question. Because you're not stopping them from acting. You're not, the fact that somebody feels hurt doesn't change their ability to act in reality. They can overcome their emotions and they can act. Force, physical force on somebody is what rights are protecting you from. Insult. Emotional hurt, feelings, is not what rights are protecting you from because feelings can be overcome. They do not stop you from acting. And, they, and they're subjective. That is, they're not, you know, I, I, can, I can see, show, when I apply force to somebody, it's clear. When I insult somebody, it's just, they're just saying they're insulted. There's no objective way of, of, of determining it. But the, the core is that rights only pertain to actions. They do not pertain to a state of mind or a state of emotion. Yohan Schiff recently tweeted something about the private sector can do it better in regards to the police. He never struck me as someone who didn't understand the role of government thoughts. I don't know. I, you know, look, the dominant, the dominant school of thought among libertarians, even among the better libertarians, but among libertarians generally is anarchy. Uh, many of them don't make a big deal out of it because they don't want to appear kooky and they, and they, and they want to they, they wanna be respectable. So I don't know if Schiff is an anarchist or not, but many uh, libertarians, even ones that I respect and, and, and uh, admire their economic ideas and, their, uh, and economics are, are anarchists. They just don't make a big deal out of it. So I wouldn't be surprised if Schiff was an anarchist, which would be sad, but I mean, it wouldn't surprise me at all. It is the dominant approach to, you know, a dominant approach to politics among certain libertarians. Somebody says Schiff is not an anarchist. I hope not. He never struck me as an anarchist, so I'm not sure what he's saying about the private sector could do it better. Right, I, about policing, because that's anarchy, if you, if you think that's a private sector job. But uh, I'd have to ask Schiff. I don't want to speculate. Uh, and there is no such thing as anarcho-capitalism, so I, I, don't use, I try not to use that term. Uh, an anarchy and capitalism are contradiction in terms. Anarchy and capitalism cannot live. Uh, capitalism requires government. There is no capitalism without government. The right kind of government, the government that is there to protect individual rights and nothing else. But you have to have government, otherwise there is no capitalism. So narco-capitalism is a contradiction in terms. All right, uh, hi from Canada. Used to, used to think of going to U.S. to pursue R&D work in space tech. Not so much anymore. You got me into Atlas Shrug, changed my life. Great, that is great for me to hear. Um, my goal, ultimately, is to get you all into Atlas Shrugged and, and to change your life if you haven't had that experience yet. Finally, last uh, Super Chat question. Are there Christian undertones, overtones to cancel culture? Yeah, there is. I mean, heresy. And these religious overtones. Cancel culture is very religious. There is dogma. There is what's acceptable. And everybody else gets burned at the stake. 
this is Catholic dogma and Catholic heresy. So cancer culture is very Catholic in this sense, very Christian in the ancient sense. Right? There is no disagreement. There is the word. There is the truth. And the word and the truth cannot be proved. They are the word and the truth because they are. And then if you disagree, disagree with them, you're, bl you're committing blasphemy. And if you're one of them, if you're a leftist in committing them, then you're an apostate. And you know, they treat apostates worse than they treat people from other, other religions, at least the Muslims do, right? So that's why the left treats its own leftists worse than they treat me, for example, or, or, or somebody who opposes them, diametrically opposed. Somebody says, my ability to defend myself is proof anarchy works. No, it's proof. You can defend yourself under the most horrific barbaric conditions. And that's what anarchy is. It's a horrific barbaric condition in which you can defend yourself until you have to face 10 people or 100 people who blow you out from your home and you can't defend yourself anymore. So you can't actually defend yourself. Not against a mob, not against a nuke, not against a tank. Doing whatever you feel like doing is horrific. Is horrific. Because if you want to murder your neighbor, that's doing what you want, right? Can be horrific. You want to have sex with children, that's doing what you want, and yet it's horrific. So doing what you want is often horrific. It depends on what you want. So you don't want to, but what if your neighbor wants to kill you? And, all the, and they say, hey, I'm allowed to do what I want. And you said it's not horrific. So any system that has no objective standards, no objective legal system, no objective principle, no rule of law, which is how we started this, well, if you don't have a monopoly over the use of force, then all you have is gang warfare. You have the mafia, you have the cartels, you have gang warfare, you have uh, violence in the streets, and there's nothing worse than that. That is the equivalent of communism and fascism. Life is as horrific under a situation like that as it is under communism or fascism. So no, I, you know, it's, it's uh, anarchy is uh, about as bad as the worst forms of government. And they always lead to that. What you need is an, uh, is an objective government guided by objective laws based on the principle of individual rights where your neighbor cannot kill you. Where you, if you feel like having sex with children can't because it's against the law and you will go to jail, which is where you belong if that's what you act on. So, no, I mean, why anarchy always comes up? It's because it's such a dominant idea, uh, you know, among, among libertarians, particularly young libertarians, but among libertarians generally. And it, it's so anti-conceptual. It's so anti-reason. It's so anti-morality that it's sad, I guess, sad. It's sad. All right. Thanks, everybody. I um, hope, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, don't forget to share, like, share, like, and subscribe. We're trying to get to 20,000 just because it's a round number and it's a good launching point for 100,000. We're trying to get to 20,000. I think we'll do it in a few weeks. The faster, the better. As always, if you, know, uh, if you know people who should be subscribed who are not, please encourage them to subscribe. If you uh, encourage your followers to subscribe, that's good as well. Um, and of course, you know, if you want to support the show, if you value the show, thank you for all the super chatters who supported the show very generous today. Uh, you can do so on Subscribestar, on Patreon, on Locals, and of course on your own book show. Dot com slash support, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Tomorrow we've got a live Q&A with some of my supporters. Uh, hopefully bandwidth will be better tomorrow. Talk to you all then. Bye, everybody.